assembly of phantasmas such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have excited such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited, but the figure in question had out-Heroded Herod, and had gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost, to whom life and death are equally jests, there are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company, indeed, seemed now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet all this might have been endured, if not approved, by the mad revellers around. But the mummer had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death, his vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with all the features of the face, was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. Edgar Allan Poe's The Mask of the Red Death, just, you know, in keeping with my theme of gender-bending 19th century literature, I shall be attempting to produce a dress that is a gender-bent version of the embodiment of this Red Death figure from the story. I have 17 days before I leave to make this dress. The original story, The Mask of the Red Death, was written in 1842 by Edgar Allan Poe, so in theory the dress should be an 1840s dress. However, as I am not going to be doing this strictly historically accurately, simply because I do not have the time to hand sew an 1840s gown and all of these subsequent understructures, I'm going to be doing a sort of fantastical interpretation on this dress based on the silhouettes of the 1840s. This project came about partly as a bit of inspiration from, if you saw my Con Marie de stashing stash organization video, you will know that I, for some reason, felt inclined to keep this massive stretch of red poly organza. I decided that this is going to be the project to put that to use. Normally, when I go into a project, I have everything very strictly planned out, all of my research, all of my patterns, all of my plans, the techniques. This project, as I am so short on time, and as it's a bit of a costumey interpretation, is going to have a lot of winging it. However, I simply cannot go into a project without some element of planning. So when I first came up with the idea a couple of months ago, actually, I just did a really quick sketch just to get the idea down on paper. And I think what I'm trying to go for this is I'm trying to go for a sort of sheer skeletal in a way that you can see all of the boning and all of the seam allowance and all of the raw edges. I have sort of a rough idea of the silhouette and the shape and vaguely what I'm going for. So what I think I'm going to do now is before I do an actual real sketch to figure out to really get my head around what I'm doing before I sit down and before I stand up and start draping, I'm going to run out to the garment district. I'm going to go have a look at what's out there and probably hopefully buy some fabrics. What I normally do is I would come up with an idea, do a rough sketch, go to the garment district, swatch fabrics for little samples of the fabrics that I'm interested in, take them back, look at the fabrics, analyze the fabrics, compare the prices, compare the yardages, what I need, then sit down and do a real sketch, drawing out where on the garment all of the fabrics are going to go, and then go back and purchase the materials, and then start on the garment. We're going to be condensing this a little bit, just in the interest of time, and also because we're doing two things that I don't normally do here. One, we are trying to not plan so hard, and two, we are trying to not stick so strictly to the history. This is going to be an intellectual challenge. So with that in mind, I think it is time to go and see what sorts of treasures we can find. trying to decide whether to put a white or a black lining under this. See, the trouble is, okay, black lining, I think, has better contrast. It makes the color a bit richer and makes it stand out a bit more. The white sort of washes it out a bit, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. See, I have it in my head that white is the color of death, not black. Oh no, calm down. I had initially drawn a black veil over the figure, but I think now I may want to do a white veil, maybe white chiffon or white net or something, and I just feel like a white 
lining under the skirt, this paler color will just tie it in a little bit better. The black veil may just obscure everything unnecessarily. However, we also have the black beading. Also, disclaimer, just so that you know, none of the colors are going to be accurate on this picture because look the devil. We are back. We have some stuff. We shall see now what we can do with this stuff. I think I have decided to underlay the skirt with white. We shall see how this goes. I'm about to go play with all of these on the dress form just to be sure that I actually made the right choices because it's sort of difficult to know that you're making the right choices whilst you are standing under fluorescent lights so you can't see colors and you just sort of want to get out of there. So the skirt is doubled up and gets quite densely pleated so I'm hoping that enough of the red will just show through. And then I also, I bought one yard of this, which is a, uh, a yard of beaded net. I'm gonna be perfectly honest, I have wanted to do this all my life. I have walked into those fabric stores with all of the rows and rows of beautiful beaded fabrics and have never been able to actually buy them, primarily because they just aren't historically accurate. So I was like, when am I ever going to use these? Now is my chance to use one of these beautiful beaded fabrics. So I bought a yard of this. My plan for this is to cut it up and to use it as applique. I think I may want to put uh, one each on the front and back, sort of around slash over top of slash in conjunction with the Bertha collar that sort of, well, goes like exactly like this. This would sort of run alongside that somehow and accentuate that. So I do one of these on the front and on the back. I'm not actually entirely sure where I'm going to place all of these applique bits. I also have these nice little embroidery bits down here, which you can't see. So these are quite nice too, that I don't know where I'm going to put these. This wasn't cheap, <laughs> I will admit, um, just because of the amount of labor that goes into a piece of fabric like this, but it is a lot of material to work with because I'm not actually using it as yardage, I'm using it as embellishment. These embellishments are on two sides, so I get twice the amount of them, which is cool. And again, I have a lot to work with here, which I'm really excited about. I am then going to drape the entire thing with this white silk chiffon veil because it is a masquerade and you're supposed to conceal your face. Because in the story, the mask is described as being so sort of realistic, like the face of death. Part of me is sort of under the impression that the figure isn't wearing a mask at all, so I was just gonna use my regular face, maybe with some blood. I haven't decided if that's going to be too theatrical or not, and then just cover my actual face with this veil. I'm not going to cover the entire front of the dress because that's the important thing, um, just sort of my face and behind and arms. I also, whilst I was there, I haven't figured out where, but I know piping is a very big thing in the early 19th century, so I bought some of this black cord. The whole purpose of this project, the whole sort of aesthetic of this project is to be able to see all of the dress making, see all of the bones and the structure, if you will, the skeleton of the dress. So I deliberately bought this black cord for the piping so that if by chance I feel like piping the bodice with this red, you know, you will see the black cord coming through. Likewise, I also bought some black twill tape so that when I put the bones in the bodice, which will hypothetically be sheer, I haven't figured out how I'm going to do that yet, you will see the boning channels coming through the material, which will be cool, I hope. I didn't purchase anything for the bodice because I realized I was a bit hesitant to cut anything off of this, but whilst I was ironing it earlier, it needs a new iron now, I realized that it's kind of really jaggedly cut. There's actually plenty of room that I can't use in the skirt that I can cut the bodice out of, which will be really nice. So I can probably do a two layer, or maybe hopefully three layer bodice out of this. I will have to back it with something because it will need structure. So I haven't figured out what I'm backing it with. Um, but hopefully something that's very unassuming. So I'm going to go sit down in front of some paper and see if I can sketch out my ideas just to start thinking about the construction, how logistically all of this is going to go together, what the patterning should look like, and yeah, just all of the little details of the dress.
bit of practical experimenting later, I'm now fairly sure on how I'm going to proceed with this dress. Join me on the eve of the gala, that is in two weeks time, to see just precisely how it's done.